Hilter? Yeah. Dear all, thank you uh, for joining us again and welcome to the Our World Heritage 2021 debates and the month really dedicated to the impact of disaster and pandemics on World Heritage sites. I am Umberto Bonomo, Director of Cultural Heritage Center at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and with uh, Fernando Perez, Karen Gole, Yolanda Muñoz and Hilter Gonzalez, I planned the, we have planned to organize the One World Seminar that bring us profound knowledge accumulated from around the world on how pandemics and natural and social disaster have affected and continue affecting our world heritage sites. The speakers of this session will kindly share different case studies, experiences and lessons, allowing us uh, to obtain a better context related to the recent situation and state of our world heritage. Throughout this month, we have organized more than uh, 20 sessions and conversation, a collective effort for of more than 100 people, some of which are from the most remote areas of the globe. Uh, I would like also to thank all the coordinators of each sessions and the presenters uh, who will accompany us throughout this month. For those who don't know the uh, Our World Heritage Foundation, it seems relevant to me to recall our goals. The purpose of our foundation is to promote heritage, protection, conservation, and management, to support knowledge-based decision-making, to promote good governance of the World Heritage Convention, and to engage and empower civil society in heritage protection and management. Having said this, I will introduce the theme of this month, sharing with you a short video that explains how disaster and pandemics have affected the world. Recent disasters and an actual pandemic have exposed the fragility and vulnerability of our world heritage. These exceptional sites and pieces, which we would like to preserve for all humanity and future generations, do not exist in a segregated world. They belong to our social environment and our daily life. But at the same time, the world heritage sites are in danger. They are threatened by natural hazards that attempt against their existence. The pandemic has revealed their fragility and how much the human presence in them is vital and necessary for their survival. How can we protect them and at the same time give them life and new meanings? If we hope for a future for them, we should stop considering them only as beautiful objects or places, merchandise for the tourist industry, and fully integrate them into the social and cultural dynamics of their life. We propose to promote a great discussion around the world on the risks and effects of disasters and pandemics on world heritage sites. We invite non-governmental organizations, academies, representatives of civil society and the local governments to participate, to contribute with new proposals for public policies on the conservation and safeguarding of the cultural and natural heritage of humanity. Today's session is organized by one of our uh, good partners, and um, is, is called Interdisciplinary Research in Disaster Risk Reduction and uh, Uncomfortable, Uncomfortable Understanding. Uh, the moderator is Carla Palma, an assistant professor at Universita, uh, University of Chile and researcher at Research Center for Integrated Disaster Risk Management, CIGIDEN. He works, uh, her works focuses on the crossroad of communication, extractivism, and social environmental disaster with a specific interest in meaning 
and uh, coastal zone communities. Carla, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to Sejida and Humberto. And I want to welcome everyone who's on, who has already joined on the session and the presenters. So at CIGIDEN, the Research Center for Integrated Disaster Risk Management, we, when we received the invitation, we started to think how, what is, it, what is the thing that we want to put onto the table to talk about disasters and to talk about heritage sites? And one of the things that we've been discussing for the last two or three years and working on it is on the relevance and the, the challenges that pose uh, to develop interdisciplinary research work and to work with the community from an interdisciplinarity perspective. And so we thought that it will be interesting to give it a little twist to the discussion on heritage sites and disasters to bring this question of what's the role of interdisciplinarity when we address these issues and we work on the field on this. So um, because consider mostly because one discipline will not be will not suffice for everything that, uh, that for all the challenges that people are facing when they're working on these sites. So having this in mind is why, how we came with the topic of interdisciplinary researching risk uh, reduction and uncomfortable understanding. So um, with us today, we have four different presenters. Actually, we have seven, but it will be four presentations. And the first one, let me introduce to uh, Dr. Arash Bustami from the Aga Khan Cultural Services in Afghanistan, who will be presenting his work on Jan Minaret in Afghanistan. And he has a very interesting presentation on the, on the challenges that face the, this very difficult site where he's working and the challenges that he's posing for his work and the need of interdisciplinary research. With us as well, we have Sara Stefanini from the University of Florence, who will be presenting her work on the Medina Fes and the multidisciplinary approach that she's developing on her work. Thank you, Sara, for being here. And we also would like to uh, introduce to Margarita Teutli from the Benemerita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla in Mexico, who uh, will introduce her work on Puebla and the diverse elements that are facing the work that she's doing, even including tourism as a, as a threat to the, to the heritage sites. And last but not least, we have uh, Belén de, Mosen, de Meson from the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú, who's presenting with uh, Maureen Forham from UCL Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction, and Dr. Pablo Vega Centeno, Sara Lafos from Pontificia Universidad Católica de Perú as well. So um, we will have presentations that will last for 15 minutes, and then we're gonna open the floor for questions that we're going to be receiving from uh, the audience. So uh, let us start. Um, Dr. Arash, uh, would you like to go first? Hello, everyone. Just let me share my screen first. Now you see my screen. Yes. Okay. I don't know how much you are familiar with the geography of Afghanistan and the problem. First of all, before getting into the subject, I want to thanks the to the organizer of this. Uh, webinars because for some countries like Afghanistan that they have valuable cultural heritage, but unfortunately they are not well presented. And then most of the challenges in Afghanistan was security. But in other hand, we think that the cultural heritage of Afghanistan was forgotten. Um, uh, today I particularly chose this building. It says amazing building located in a very remote area because it has some particular challenges. And I just want to draw attention of the people in this field. First of all, I want to say that I was not working directly in this project. I was, as a researcher, I was interested about 
uh, seismology of the area, and then particularly this minaret. At this moment, I'm working in another minaret in Herat with the Florence University team. But this subject was more interesting. The, the things that I'm presenting is a result of the many years of working of Professor Andra Bruno, Professor Margottini, and many others who really worked in this area. First of all, be familiar with the location. If you look at the Afghanistan map, the location of the Jam Minaret is between Herat and Kabul, is around 260 kilometer uh, east of Herat, somewhere in this location. But The, the minaret positioned in a deep river valley at the junction of the Harirud River and its uh, the Jam Road River. The Jam is Jam Road is not a big river, but it caused a lot of problem, and then we will talk about this later. This is location located in the Hindu Kush area. And the location that uh, is about 1,900 meter above sea level. Probability erected between 100,063 and uh, 1203 AD during the Uri dynasty under the Sultan Qiyasuddin. The amazing monument was always known to the locals living in the nearby villages. Sorry, can you see because my screen is blocked? Yeah, yeah, we see perfectly. Um, this amazing tall monument was always known to the local, but it was not introduced to the people until in 1944, Afghan scholar Ahmad Ali Kozad published an article about this beautiful monument. Due to the harsh territory, none of the missions to finding the site was successful. The 1952 Delegation Archaeologie Francaise in Afghanistan, or in short, DAFA, expedition just reached as far as Chesh. It's 50 kilometers far of this building. Finally, in August 18, 1957, uh, Andre Marik, a member of Delegation Archaeology Afghanistan, rediscovered the Gurid Minaret of Jam. In March 1958, Marik presented his discovery of the Minaret of Jam, and he wrote his article and published it next year. Unfortunately, or sadly, he died in 1960 while he was just 34 years old. In September 1961, the Italian architect Andre Bruno, commissioned by the Italian Institute for the Middle East, Middle and, Middle East and Far East, uh, in short called ISMEO, and the Afghan governments started to surveying and documenting the monument. Before any intervention, the proper study was needed, but at all the time, access to the site was very challenging. Andre Bruno witnessed the inclination of the minaret towards the Harirud River in August 1963, with the collaboration of the inhabitants of the nearby village, a series of essential conservation took place on the site. As you could see in these drawings, a part of the building is located underground because it's located next to the river and the flood is already covered the entrance of the building. The height of the building is around 65 meter.
and the building is already made of a uh, baked brick as a main shaft in three parts, and we have two staircase inside. If you're looking at Afghanistan map, you could see that we have three main fault. One is the Herat fault, is actually is connecting Herat to the Pamir fault, and Jam is located exactly next to the fault. Another one is going to the Pakistan area, they call Chaman, but it's more active than the Hari Root fault. Anyway, the seismicity map of Afghanistan shows the vulnerability of the building and particularly this tall standalone minaret in Yeah. I think we that lost. we lost uh, yeah. Dr. Bustami. Yeah, he came back. Shall we, shall we wait till he can so he can reconnect or yeah, he is he's back. He's back. Harash, we had problem with your connection. Yeah. Now you're back. Maybe what we can do is to maybe you can turn off your camera so you only display the presentation and we can hear your voice. So maybe that will make it better. Arash? We can hear you. Yeah. Carla, maybe we can we can start with another presentation and give Arash the possibility to, to present uh, uh, again yeah. at the end. Yeah. Or maybe to have to, yeah to find be better connection because it's not working. I just want to know if Arash can hear us, so he knows what we're gonna do, how we're gonna proceed. Excuse me, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Maybe. Maybe let's give it another try now that you uh, turn off your camera so we can we can give I it another try. Off my camera, I don't know if you can see me again. We, I think that we can hear you better now and okay. we can see your screen. So if you want to restart your presentation. From the beginning? Not from the beginning, but from when you were at least at what the last thing that I could hear was how tall the building was. And then is when we started to have problems. Okay. There we go. Okay. These are the first drawings prepared by Professor Andre Bruno on his second mission to the site. As you could see, the building is built uh, in three area. The diameter in the base is around eight meter. The height of the building is 65 meter. But the interesting thing is here we have a two staircase. It means at the same time, two people could go up from this two staircase without meeting each other up to the top. Uh, unfortunately today, a part of this building around five meters is under a layer of sediment there because it's located, as I mentioned, next to the river. And the river is going to flood almost every second or third year. This accumulated 
uh, silt around the building, increasing the humidity inside the building. But this is just one of the problems that we face with this building. The main problem is the earthquake in area. As you can see in the map, we have the Herat Fault uh, just passing next to the Jom Minaret. Distribution of earthquake in Afghanistan shown in this map, this is uh, showing that area is not very active in the last uh, 1000 years, but historical other evidence shows in Herat, we had two big earthquakes and that affected even the Jam Minaret. Unfortunately, we don't have enough written document to be So we lost Arach again. Um... This is the uniform hazard, the spectra obtained at the jump. And uh, this is for the written period of 72 to 975 years. The, er the period that we think that we had earthquake in the... I think that we lost a connection with Dr. Bustami. And so we're gonna, we're gonna wait till he can reconnect. And then at the end of the round of presentations, we will give him five more minutes to round up on the presentation. So we can continue with the other presenters while he can find a better internet connection from Afghanistan. So- I'm um, sorry, I think I already disconnected again. If you give yeah. me- if I put me at the end, then I can come back. Maybe I will find another solution. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe you can tell us without having, we're gonna to have to reduce the, the broadband that you need. Maybe you can just tell us with all the presentation or maybe to send the presentation to someone, to me, or we can display that on the screen maybe. Um, okay, I will, solution, okay, I will try to reconnect again. You continue, I will try to join you again in another place. Okay. I have to thank move. You. Thank you. Okay, so um, to continue, we're gonna ask uh, Dr. Sara Stefanini from the University of Florence if she can go with her presentation. Um, thank you everyone who has joined already the, the session. We have people saying hi from Mexico, from the UK, from Germany. So we welcome you. Um, we will come back to the, with the presentation of Arash later, and we will continue now with the work of Sarah Stefanini. So you have a floor and thank you very much for being here and accepting our invitation. Thank you for this invitation, this opportunity. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, perfectly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, here I will present my PhD research, which describes uh, an approach for seismic vulnerability assessment using a multidisciplinary approach. In particular, the procedure takes into account building typologies of Islamic cities, uh, which are aggregate patio houses. Uh, this method has been applied to the case study of uh, Fes Medina in Morocco, UNESCO World Heritage Site since uh, 1981. Uh, the work motivation was given by the increasing concern about the threats endangering Maghreb's architectural heritage. Uh, this heritage is threatened by the loss of traditional knowledge, the uncritical use of incompatible technolo technological cultures, and natural hazards such as earthquakes. Uh, Fas Medina is an emblematic example of this damaging uh, dynamics. I have divided my talk into the following main areas. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the conservation context and the social context. 
secondly, I will present the results of the studies and investigations carried out to deepen the knowledge of the case study. Uh, then I will present the proposed seismic vulnerability assessment method, and uh, after that, the implementation in the Medina office. Uh, then I will look at the conclusion referring to the application of the method. Uh, I have used a multidisciplinary approach considering both uh, humanistic sociological topics and technical scientific topics. Uh, in the end, uh, this approach was used to imagine a rehabilitation strategy that is coherent with the context, uh, with the dynamics taking place and the vulnerability issues. Uh, so let's start with the context. Uh, the theme of conservation in Morocco was influenced by the French colonial period. Uh, before this period, conservation was not conceived as a concept in, in itself. It was not separated from the usual construction and maintenance activities of the buildings. The French legislature represented a total change uh, with new materials, new techniques, and a new lifestyle. Uh, the legacy of the French protectorate was uh, dual cities. There were the new modern cities and the Medinas separated from each other. In this situation, the Medinas were abandoned and they were not adapted to contemporary needs. Uh, one of the results of this uh, cultural shock is the conflict between tradition and modernity. Uh, the consequences of this conflict are already underway. Uh, during the research, uh, we carried out some interviews with locals and this conflict emerged from that. Uh, the change in contemporary lifestyle does not combine well with the urban conformation of the Medina, and this is generally felt and experienced by locals. Uh, the built environment and its use reflect these changes with also some critical issues. Uh, the interviews also highlighted how the recovery of the architectural heritage and the social sphere are strictly, strictly connected. An emblematic example of that is the perception of, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, okay, uh, is the perception of seismic risk. I don't know, okay. Uh, the interviews show that the religious sphere and the cultural level are connected to the seismic risk perception. FES in particular is considered, considered a city protected by Allah and the patron saint, Mullah Idris. Uh, this causes many people to deem it impossible for an earthquake uh, to occur or have occurred in the past. Uh, the, seismic, uh, the city seismic chronology shows uh, otherwise. The city of Fez was largely destroyed following the seismic events of 1522, 1624, and 1755. Uh, furthermore, referring to seismic events in recent years, earthquakes like Agadir Swan and Alosemas have shown that uh, in Morocco it's important not to underestimate the consequences on the population and the build-up area. Uh, the effects of seismic events uh, points out the extreme building vulnerability despite uh, moderate seismicity. Uh, this shows the importance of the knowledge about the local construction culture uh, to identify its characteristics and its critical issues to assess the building's uh, vulnerability. Uh, Fassi building culture has developed uh, some construction techniques uh, that give uh, earthquake resistance to buildings. Uh, these techniques are um, uh, contrast arches and vaults, Covered passages, drain arches, uh, wooden elements inside the wall structure. Uh, that despite differences, this technique is very similar to that within the Casbah of Algiers. Uh, wooden chain, and finally, techniques such as that observed inside the patio of the altar in Mederza. Uh, it, here, it's possible to see those that seem to be uh, seismic isolators. However, even with these uh, anti-seismic techniques, various types of recurrent and systematic damages were observed, 
and diagnosed, diagnosed during inspection in the Medina. The most uh, widespread and worrying failure is the bulging, both vertical and horizontal, a warning uh, for bending mechanism. Another type of pervasive damage is represented by the systems of diagonal cracks that mainly involve uh, the covered passages, and uh, many buildings show a high level of degradation. The problems can be traced back to these diagnostic categories, uh, weaknesses related to the architectural typology of the patio houses, overutilization and overdensification of the buildings, lack of maintenance, problems of water infiltration and rising damp dampness and su uh, subsidence of the soil. Also, there are many transformation and modifications uh, made with incompatible materials and techniques, making the situation worse. Uh, and finally, the collapse of many buildings increased the vulnerability because it leads to many empty spaces. Uh, the population well receives these new spaces, but they weaken their buildings, depriving them of the beneficial, beneficial effects of the aggregate system. To gain an in-depth knowledge of the construction types, uh, we carried out an investigation campaign on traditional masonry. In particular, we carried out mineral mineralogical and mechanical characterization tests, evaluation of quality of different types of masonry through the masonry quality index, and tilt tests to assess the wooden elements contribution to the resistance. Briefly, uh, the investigation has shown that the quality of the mortar changes with the, the type of area in the Medina. More noble neighborhoods have a better mortar than the more um, modest neighborhoods. Uh, the ancient brick sample has good mechanical characteristics, slightly better than the brick uh, samples used to restore with the traditional um, technique. Uh, the quality of the analyzed masonry is medium poor, except for a few, few well-built types. And the wooden elements it modifies the response in the plane of the wall panel, increasing the number of brick interfaces involved, uh, and so increasing the friction force, and by modifying the portion of the wall involved in the mechanism. And now let's move to the assessment method. Uh, in Morocco, research still lacks if we consider indisp indispensable relating the seismic risk assessment to the house's characteristics and construction typologies. We have seen the damages that reveal the need to define an assessment method that considers the local building teacher to describe its vulnerabilities. The proposed uh, assessment method is based on the GNDT second level approach. Uh, proposed by the Italian National Group of Earthquake Defense. The procedure has been adapted to the feature of the Maghreb uh, Amazon rebuildings, looking for adaptability of the investigation strategy and operability on the aggregate system, aggregate scale, yes. Uh, the identification of the various vulnerability factors happened through 20 parameters uh, grouped in five different sections that uh, express their constructive nature. We have chosen two areas within Fes Medina to be the subject of an in-depth study. They have been selected for their representativeness concerning architectural typology of the Medina, considering the different uh, traditional materials, the characteristics of the structural systems, the main critical issues and the typical situation of degradation and damage found in the Medina. For each building, a vulnerability judgment was expressed according to the different parameters and the vulnerability index was calculated. According to EMS 98, the world sample has a vulnerability equivalent to a class B and uh, approximately 12% of buildings have a vulnerability index equivalent to class A. Um, therefore, the sample vulnerability is moderately high. Uh, once the vulnerability index has been assessed, the mean damage grade can be estimated, and then uh, vulnerability curves were obtained from the mean damage uh, grade. After the beta probability function was used to construct damage histograms for different seismic intensities, and also damage scenarios have been estimated. 
Uh, here, the figures show damage scenarios for seismic action corresponding to intensities 7, 8, 9, and 10, which are the intensities reported for historical seismic events. We can observe that uh, for a seismic event of intensity 7, uh, the sample shows slight to moderate uh, damage. For intensity 8, the sample suffered from moderate structural damage and heavy non-structural uh, damage. For an event of intensity 9, the damages are very heavy with the collapse of some buildings. And for earthquakes of intensity 10, the total collapse of buildings is estimated. Uh, finally, fragility curves and the estimation of losses have been carried out. Uh, the economic losses and the repair costs were not estimated due to the lack of economic data. Um, then, to predict the impact of consolidation action, the assessment was applied a second time on the same samples after simulated the structural risk of fitting intervention. Um, the supposed structural consolidation was considered consistent with the construction logic using homogeneous materials and compatible technique. Um, the structural reinforcement significantly reduces the sample vulnerability, as shown by the distribution histograms of the obtained vulnerability indices and vulnerability curves. Uh, but the representation that best show the improvement are the damage scenarios. They show that considering the building sample after the consolidation interventions, the damage decreases by about one degree of the EMS 98 scale for seismic events of the same intensity. Uh, in conclusion, the work focus is the definition of a GNDT level two based method for seismic uh, vulnerability assessment at the aggregate scale. The method is calibrated on the characteristics of historical settlements at risk of disappearance in the Maghreb area and was applied to a building sample within the Medina office. Um, the analysis showed that the level of damage can be significant even in a region with a moderate seismic hazard, such as the city of Fes. Uh, the high vulnerability of the buildings is the cause, the cause of that. The vulnerability is linked to the characteristics of the patio houses and the bad taste of conservation increases. Widespread and careful consolidation um, can sign significantly reduce the damage level as indicated by the damage scenarios. Um, we are coming to the end of my presentation and I would like to conclude it by focusing on the rehabilitation strategy. The complexity uh, of a dynamic uh, historical city such as Fes Medina makes it necessary not only a restoration project, uh, what is needed is urban revitalization and uh, an adaptive reuse. We need to find a balance between, uh, on one side, the reinterpretation of tradition, considering modern needs, and on the other side, the subordination of contemporary development processes to a general idea of cultural and urban continuity. Uh, we need to find a balance between the traditional Islamic houses and the new needs of contemporary living. Um, I think that we can imagine a possible answer in the typology of co-housing. Co-housing shares many characteristics with the Islamic lifestyle and other features would solve some problems. Together with the co with career, coherent consolidation action, mitigating the structural vulnerability, this housing model uh, used in the context of the patio house could represent a strategy to experiment uh, at least. Uh, I conclude with this uh, quotation from uh, my interviews, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, Sarah. Uh, I have already many questions for you that I'm going to keep for the end of the rounds of presentations. And I would like to introduce Dr. Margarita Teutli from the Benemerito Universidad Autónoma de Puebla, who will be sharing her work on Puebla. And Margarita? Este, sí, estoy lista para comenzar. Voy a apagar la cámara. I am going to turn off my camera and share the screen.
Okay, thank you. Could you allow me to share the screen? Oh, well, this is my presentation, Puebla Heritage City in Danger by Natural and Anthropogenic Activities. Um, I am starting with the location of the Puebla City. This is the Mexican Republic. This is the state of Puebla. And in this place is the Puebla City. So the historical center of Puebla in a map you can see is a, a regular grid of streets and the historic center covers this region that is about little red. Um, information about Puebla, we are up above 20,000 meters above sea level. We had a very good weather well-defined seasons for spring, summer, fall, and winter. And the city has about 498 all. And the orientation is good. And we had a lot of buildings from the 16th and 17th century. And this is an aerial view of the city. You can see it's, it's retaining the historical grid. And the new buildings are located outside of the historical center. And we had an active volcano nearby. <laughs> what has changed a lot, the amount of the par particles in the air. So we are having now strong problems of contamination, um, helped by the emissions of the volcano. And Puebla has suffered a, a, several earthquakes with magnitude about, above seven. These are the main ones, and you can see that there is a period return, something like 20 to 30 years. And I'm going to talk to you about the last two, the 1999 and the 2017 because from those one, I had some more information. And the 1999 uh, damage were catastrophic for a lot of places and religious buildings. And methodology to assess the damage has improved with the years. And in 2017, same, we had estimated that we had 563 religious buildings with damage and people who, re, who recovered the data made a classification of the century and the number of buildings affected. And also they established some kind of uh, degree of affectation and define like low affectation, medium affectation and high affectation. The most buildings has low affectation, but the damage are very critical. And this is the time that almost four years ago, um, we haven't had uh, restored all the, all the buildings. Uh, you can see here, this is a picture from the 1999 uh, earthquake. And these are from the 2017. Um, catastrophic for the damage in mortars, in bowels, domes, and uh, the towers, bell towers were damaged uh, in many, many, many buildings. 
and people has uh, institutions to care about the the problems and we had uh, some and national level the anthropology and history institute the national center for disaster prevention uh, also the army and navy has uh, uh, plans to help people mainly and at the state level we had the universities and the organizations and professionals uh, boards and Puebla, after the sales of the 1999, and the, they created something called the Board of Puebla Historical Center and the Citizen Forum. And what we had learned from the earthquakes. In 1999s, we had lack of plans for maintenance and mitigation. And in, two, in the period between, uh, we start to formulate some actions. In prevention, we, I think we had a lot of improvement because we had uh, the information of buildings, susceptibility to be damaged. The, in the case of the historic buildings, the inventory of the staff and maintenance plans for each building about characterizing like urgent, regular, and long-term. In the intervention protocols to, at the time of the event, we had some role assignment and we had some advance in the handling of emergency protocols for damage inventory and debris inventory that is, was, apply it very successfully in the 2017 earthquake. But we are having a lot of troubles still is in the interventions projects. Because uh, people taking care, uh, see, for instance, this is a, the map uh, elaborated by the Citizen Forum, and they had cataloged the buildings and established that there were 17 polygons to care about with similarities in the constructions and the kind of buildings that are included. But the people taking the intervention projects, we are dealing with people that still thinks that it must be one or the other option, but no, they, they are no considering like an integrated part. Um, actually, in the architecture school, they think that these actions so, should be over, overlapping. So you must care at the same time for replacement, repairing, and rehabilitated. And the conservation specialists taking on, on their hands the restoration pro project, the intervention, they, they should be with an attitude permeable to the engineering and technology, the social science and natural science. So they account for everything that is possible about information because we require static and structural information. We need environmental information and anthropogenic because uh, in Puebla is, it has serious problems with the tourists. Uh, I can affirm that from the 2010, uh, now to 2021, we had raised the tourists in 300%. You see the lot of people, uh, many vehicles in the historic center. And these are causing uh, several problems because the tourists require service and people providing them and also the amount of waste 
has increased and the resource consumption is also raised. Uh, Puebla has a little scarcity of um, drinking water. Um, is with the increasing tourists, you must provide good service, but the exploitation of the groundwater is taking the, the resources down. And for instance, we did a work about finding urban heat island points in the historic center. We know that there are a lot of pictures from satellite, and but we try to do the evaluation at the floor level. So we take readings at the morning is the inner circle, at the middle of the day is the medium circle, and the outer one is the afternoon lecture. And we see that there are some places where the site gets warm, but it doesn't get down in temperature, at least up to 9 p.m. And this has a direct uh, uh, relationship with the people because in the center, the 45 points that we sampled, uh, we found that this is the amount of places uh, dedicated to commercial use, being hotels and grocery stores and small convenience stores. And this it involves a lot of people going through vehicles and service to provide. So the historic center is being highly impacted by the amount of people circulating through the historic center. Um, we had uh, the conservation restoration experts at Puebla to change their point of view because they must be there, they must be open to the scientists from the several disciplines and use most of the technological instruments that they can and the anthropologic studies studies are necessary to uh, look forward to the reuse of the historic buildings because many houses uh, from the beginnings of 1920 um, were changed to hotels <laughs> and with that one, uh, sometimes the, rest, the restoration of the, or, ad, or adequation of the buildings are not properly done. And they are not caring about respecting the um, regular um, is materials and the structures. And they used to, uh, let's say, they put some iron where there are no necessity to, to use, or they try to mix reinforcements. Yeah. And this is uh, my contribution for you. Thank you very much, Margarita. Um, listening to all your presentations actually makes me longing from traveling, <laughs> looking at all your presentations and seeing the picture of the places where you're working. Um, for the next presentation, we are going to have Helen de Maison from the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú presenting her work uh, with Dr. Marine Forham and Pablo Vega Centeno Saralafos. But Belen, she's going to be the one presenting the work from, um, from Peru. I think that you're in Peru right now, right? No, I'm in, in the UK. But, um, you're in the UK? Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, well, Thank you for the invitation and also to Maureen for um, this opportunity to work together in our reflections. So um, I will be talking about the set, a process of settlement relocation currently going on, uh, promoted by the Peruvian government, uh, relocating uh, peri-urban population living in a floating 
uh, area of Iquitos, which is the largest city in the Amazon, uh, the Peruvian Amazon rainforest, and we relocated from this floating area uh, to um, inland. But at first, uh, we wanted to discuss what is uh, heritage in Peru, and like a typical approach would be to think about buildings from the Inca Empire, like Machu Picchu, and when we're talking about people, we understand it as dances, folkloric dances, and like ways of dressing, for instance. But um, we wanted to emphasize that other part of heritage, which is the way we inhabit and recognize our territory um, and how we transform it and um, form a relationship with it. In this um, scenario, we discuss about, uh, normally when we think about Peru, we think about the Andes uh, and the highlands and llamas, but actually Peru is over 60% Amazonian, uh, particularly in the uh, low, uh, low Amazon rainforest, so it's a flat area. I'm representing about uh, the area of Loreto in Peru, which is the largest region in Peru. And to give you an idea, uh, it's bigger than the country of Ecuador and even um, Germany in size. But you have around 1 million people living in the area. About half of them are in the city of Iquitos. So uh, it's important to understand the territorial characteristics of the place. It's a territory which is constantly if movement uh, from what we're seeing here in the, at the horizontal level in the changing course of the rivers, but also at the vertical level in the changing tides from like the rain season to the dry season. So this is a picture taken in the same place in August, which is the dry season and in January. So the water level rises up and down for uh, about in the difference of five meters. So you can see this here as well, like this in the border of the city and how it changes dramatically from one season to the other. Um, and I think that is important uh, as a fundamental aspect to understand the way uh, the Amazonia has been inhabited for centuries and also how then that varied through the creation of cities, which is uh, in comparison to most places, I would say a relatively new phenomena. So before uh, the arrival of cities towards the turn of the 19th century, we had dispersed populations of tribes that were also nomadic. They moved from one place to another uh, following the changing course uh, of the rivers, but also like the dynamic, like the dynamism of the territory itself. Uh, an important characteristic of, uh, that is relevant to most of these cultural groups is that they all have some sort of maloca, which is understood as a community center. So they all get together, either they live, all of them live in, within this center or they live outside of each house, uh, each family has a house, but they'll all carry out communal activities in these places, which, are, which can be quite large, uh, over 200 meters wide. And they also get constructed and rebuilt as the, these tribes moves. And you have like different typologies of the maloca but it was, as, as I was saying, like the main community center. Um, and it's also really important to understand that the level of symbolic relationship that exists between people and the river is not only a place where you get your food or a mode of transportation. Um, it also like the minute you're born, you learn how to swim and like all the um, spiritual connections that exist between the water and the people. So I think that also important to understand and what we're going to see uh, later on as these populations are being displaced from uh, and away from the water. And this is a map that shows uh, like the territories of different tribes. Uh, it's important here to emphasize the connection between those territories in which these tribes moved around, but also like the connection between those territories and the river itself. So everything departs from this connection between river, a forest, and people. And uh, towards the end of the, towards the turn of the 19th century, we see the appearance of cities. Uh, Iquitos appeared as a protection site, like in, promoted by the Peruvian government to protect the boundaries between Peru, Brazil, and Colombia. And this also grew much larger during the rubber boom uh, that was in the beginnings of the 20th century. And here you can see uh, 
the breaking of a particular way of inhabiting and the appearance of something that's uh, more Western or colonial in the sense that you have the grid and you have this uh, idea of the city becoming a port city. Um, as you can see here, it's very much quadricular. And in this area, I don't know if you can see my mouse, uh, but this is area the area where uh, the population that we're discussing uh, inhabited throughout the time. Like it's the first shanty town um, in the Amazonian, uh, in the Peruvian Amazonian. So with the rubber boom, you had a complete disruption of previous ways of living. Uh, so people were taken away from the Malocas and from the community groups and displaced into reduction uh, sites. So you get to see the last instances of slavery, even though it was already prohibited, since these were seen as being like outside citizenship, citizenship outside the state, uh, they were regarded as less than uh, human beings. But and in this conflicting uh, scenario, you also have the rapid expansion of cities like Iquitos with a very, um, I would say, influence from European cities and city models that basically uh, were imposed on a territory uh, that, as we have seen, does not necessarily follow uh, sedentary uh, movements and occupations. So this is a picture of Iquitos in 1998, and it's quite impressive to see like the rapid transformation that occurred between um, the tribes that used to move around uh, from one place to another and they had that already uh, very well acknowledged territories and the appearance of a city that rapidly grew uh, with the boom and that connected the Amazon rainforest with the rest of the world for the very first time. Well, like not the very first time, but I would say in a way that has that was not there uh, before uh, during the colonies and in the beginning of the Republic. And this is Iquitos today. So you can see like this confluence of um, Amazonian architecture and way of living, uh, European city models, and also like the idea of, of modernity arriving through like high uh, rise buildings and um, ante uh, antennas and all of this. And as I was saying, like this is the city of Iquitos towards like I would say 1940s, this picture is undated. And you can see here, the appearance of Belen, which is the first shanty town, it uh, emerged as the place where the slaves from the rubber boom escaped the reduction sites that were located throughout the territory and came um, and, and, and settled next to the city. And from the very beginning, it was a settlement that again opposed this idea of uh, European city making and rescued. Uh, traditional construction techniques and ways of inhabiting that uh, included floating houses, but also houses built on silt and the use of wood. Uh, so we're seeing here, it's like a very life heritage that constantly changes and evolves, but at the same time, uh, it's results to be appropriate for um, the area and is also like dynamic flows. And we are seeing here a picture of Belen nowadays, uh, the houses and the architecture remains the same in this, um, but you start seeing the appearance of satellite dishes and electricity. So it's like this confluence of flows, uh, but through the preservation of a particular way of, of living. And this is a photograph of Belen nowadays, it's a lot more dense, uh, but the connection between the population and the river pretty much remains. It's also important to notice that these are all basically multi-sided households. So the houses are inhabited by certain parts or groups of the family, but they keep moving and uh, traveling through like every three months or so to the forest. So it's like a very also dynamic occupation. Like even though the house remains in sight, this idea of moving around the territory and have a connection between the city and the forest is pretty much present at the time. And uh, well, Peru is one of the only, I would say uh, that I know of two countries in South America that have preventive resettlement is Peru and Colombia. So the idea of being able to understand uh, which um, sites are gonna suffer the impacts of climate change 
and being able to relocate those people before the disaster happens. And uh, so we're seeing that eventually the Amazon River, right now, Belen is located in one of the tributaries, but in the next 20 or 40 years, the tributary will be um, conquered by the Amazon River. And when that happens, the, house, the houses that we're seeing uh, right now in this picture will not be able to sustain the force of like the largest uh, river on earth. And what the Peruvian government is doing is they're relocating them 13 kilometers away from this site uh, on the um, expansion and the peri-urban peri area of Iquitos next to the forest. And with this type of housing and uh, more than an hour and a half away from the river. And we're seeing that this kind of settlement, uh, again, not recognizing the dynamic nature of the territory is not at the moment be, uh, has not solved the um, necessity to have access to water and sanitation, uh, but also uh, disconnects the people with the like symbolic relationship they had with the river and promotes a kind of architecture that results to be very foreign to them. Specifically, uh, the size of the houses are 40 um, meters squared and you have families that are with a household with eight or more members. And you also have like this complete disruption with the livelihoods. So even though the risk is understood by the government as being um, vulnerable to flooding in the future, uh, the solution to that is very technocratic and top down um, and thought as okay, what the solution to avoid people being um, vulnerable to flooding is to move them away from the river, but that um, does not really include other dimensions that drive vulnerability. Um, so I think in that sense, I uh, pretty much, I'm, I'm thankful for being able to discuss this in a interdisciplinary forum, because um, I think that this shows basically the necessity to have an interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary understanding of drivers of vulnerability, of what risk is, and also of uh, what is then um, heritage. The idea of like be treating people as refugees without agency and without uh, any knowledge of adapting capacities towards uh, changing circumstances, environmental changing circumstances, or treating them as citizens with rights and knowledge that should be also included in the discussion the decision-making processes towards uh, improving their lives. And also in that sense, uh, what is then heritage and what is patrimony uh, and what is worth saving? Um, it's just in this case, when we're talking about the Amazon River Forest, the forest itself, uh, but also the knowledge and traditions of the people that occup have occupied that territory for ages and that know it, um, and even though it's not something that remains in time, but it's continuously evolving, like the houses and the ways of construction, then um, how then to rescue or to uh, shed light into the importance of protecting that heritage, because that will eventually also um, protect the way and the lifestyles of people. So thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation, Belen. Um, is Dr. Uh, Bustani here to give him his five minutes to run up the presentation? I think that he continue having internet access difficulties. So, um, well, first of all, thank you everyone who joined the presentation who joined the panel while we were um, having the presentations. And I would like to ask all the presenters to turn on the cameras. Um, so I don't know if people have questions, but I will, as Catherine says on the chat, if everyone have any question, please leave it there. But I would like to ask you a first question because I was listening to your presentations and one of the one of the keywords that it came to my mind it was about this idea of movement 
because all of you somehow are facing different kind of movement. The movement produced by earthquakes, the movement produced by pollution, the movements of people. And I was wondering how do you address this and and the other other factors that you have to face when you are developing your work, when it comes to having to plan an interdisciplinary work. So my first question here will be on how do you um, facing these different issues that you have on your work. How do you uh, get into a interdisciplinary conversation when you are facing similar issues, but from different perspectives? How hard it is for you to establish a conversation that involves all the different factors that you face on your work? I, I can speak for that because I am a chemical engineer, uh, my profession. And now I am working with the architectures in the graduate school program of conservation and restoration. And it's very hard to make them understand that there are chemistry behind the products that they, they apply. <laughs> so uh, I had to show them uh, physically, how the paint applies over the surface, made the impermeable cover, so they can trust what is happening. And I'm, I am claiming the, a lot about the, they must care about the chemistry of the old materials to apply new materials over them. So it, it is hard that they accept uh, they, their will to do some changes in, the, in their minds in, in using new products, but without affecting the, the chemistry of the old uh, um, masonry or uh, bricks or something like that. So somehow it is hard for you to have a conversation about the impacts of what people are doing from a chemistry perspective, right? Yes, right. Uh, as for instance, uh, we did a evaluation of the damage for rainfall in the cathedral of Puebla, but I am chemist, so I collect the samples and analyze what happened, what cations and anions were dissolved, et cetera. And we found very uh, important uh, information because the most impacted by rainfall, uh, it was the north side, while the less impacted was the south side but the south side is uh, affected by the pollution of the volcano because the particles go to deposit and the humidity of the environment may dissolving the salts and penetrate the stone. <laughs> mm. we, we did a, a complete sampling um, taking advantage that the belt tower face the four cardinal points. <laughs> so we can discriminate north, sur, south, and east, and west uh, problems with the rainfall only. Mm. But uh, for architects, they say, no, 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 this is not important. <laughs> it will be really interesting to be in one of those meetings when you are discussing uh, how to look at the building. I don't know, Sara, maybe you want to, you, I think that I, I saw your face like you have something to say about it. Yes, yes. Um, I, as an architect, I think that uh, this profession teach to manage uh, different kind of problems uh, from uh, structural problems, technological problems, uh, sociological problems, uh, architecture projects. And uh, the, um, since the university uh, architects uh, 
uh, needs to find the, the uh, sensibility to manage every kind of uh, problems uh, and put them uh, inside a project. And uh, it's difficult because uh, you have to uh, go in depth in, uh, in the analysis and the specific problems, but uh, you have to be able to, uh, at the end uh, or in the middle of the proce process to, uh, to do a step uh, a general uh, and see uh, a general view of the project to uh, takes in, to take into account every kind of e kind of issues because I think that uh, uh, the multidisciplinarity and the interdisciplinarity, especially in the conservation and the rehabilitation of heritage, is uh, fundamental because uh, uh, heritage came from. Uh, our, uh, our, the people uh, before us uh, and uh, the life inside the buildings, inside the heritage uh, uh, took to us the, these beautiful buildings and we have to consider the life inside the buildings. Uh, not on, we don't, we don't, I think that we don't have to consider only technical, uh, uh, views, but also anthropological and sociological uh, issues. Mm. Mario Santana on the comments said, uh, I think architects should not take the lead with communities. We have anthropologists and sociologists that work on this better than us. I, I, and I know that we all have different um, specialties, but the question is how how to make them work together, how to let space for others who know better maybe or are more equipped to conduct some of the process and how to make this uh, like a more complex process in which everyone's doing what they know the best, but at the same time have this in conversation with each other. Um, I don't know if Belen want to chip in the conversation here. Um, yes, uh, well, also disclaimer, I, I am an architect, <laughs> yeah, but uh, we work in a very interdisciplinary uh, team, but I would say, uh, going back to Mario's comment, um, this idea of like anthropologists and sociologists working better with the communities than architects, um, I tend to disagree with that. I think it, is, it needs to be a, a communal work in progress, but what we bring as architecture is also this idea of like understanding the, the spatial qualities that are sometimes not spoken and understood. Like there's this level of like talking and commenting with them, but like also observing how they live, how the settlement is distributed, their movement patterns. And uh, in, in particular, in the case of uh, Amazonia, I would say uh, understanding that movement uh, has been now nowadays considered a problem like migration, uh, but I would say in, in this case, we need to understand that there are ways of living in which movement is how settlements came to be. Uh, so this idea of, of I, I know it's, it's uh, within heritage and within architecture and how within our cities, like a very uh, static understanding, because uh, that's what we know, like even me that I'm, I'm, I'm from, from Lima, but this idea of being able to understand movement as an adaptation strategy. Uh, and another thing I think is important with um, disasters and risks, it's uh, sometimes it gets the understanding of the causes or like why people become vulnerable tend to be oversimplified as well. So we only focus on the environmental uh, reason, right? So climate change is the one to blame. And then that's how we start thinking about it. But like, I think that uh, renders invisible other structural causes that make those people vulnerable in the first place, like social, um, economic, political, and even like I would say in, in the built environment itself uh, through the lack of recognition of other adaptation strategies. So I think in that sense, uh, heritage becomes uh, a goal or a, an understanding of a process of how certain lifestyles came to be, but also how can they be uh, protected uh, over time, but also improved, understanding that we cannot also have 
purely a romantic idea uh, of that lifestyle, but that how it needs to adapt to this ever-changing climate and not only ever-changing, but like an increasingly uh, disruptive climate, climatic conditions. So if I'm hearing well, were you saying like actually everyone should be able to engage with the communities and to, from whatever discipline you are working from? I think so, yes. But I think it's also like the, the understanding that uh, in many cases, in policies and that sometimes in, even in, with our own disciplines, in architecture or others, um, those voices or those capacities and adaptation strategies that are already in place are not recognized or put into the table. So I think it's also a matter of understanding that there should be a more horizontal relationship in decision-making processes. Mm. And I, I have some questions here that uh, are related to the same. One of them is from Stefan Vogel, and he says, we hear that buildings use and tourism are human related factors that affect heritage sites. How are these dimensions addressed in restoration projects in such a way that it works for everyone? And then there is another question from Fernanda Girosa who says, who, how can you protect the people in the Amazons from a disaster and at the same time preserve their culture and heritage? So I think that both questions are addressing these issues, how, how to do this, addressing people's uh, concerns, involving people in the process and at the same, like doing the best for the heritage sites and doing the best for the people. And I think that some of you were talking, I think it was you, Belen, right? What is heritage at the end? So. I don't know, I opened the floor here for um, Milen, Sara, and Margarita. Margarita, we can hear you. There you yeah. go. It is hard to, uh, to deal with people. For instance, <laughs> in, the, in the 2017 earthquake, uh, the institutions called the universities for people to support in the evaluation of damage, etc. But students doesn't have the, the formation to work in a place. So we had the actions like someone that suggests that every, every debris should be removed without caring, it is an important piece of the building or a, an artistic expression. <laughs> so for, to get organized the, the students to support the actions was very, very, very difficult to, to engage everyone. And also another of another situation was that the students immediately start to go into the construction without, uh, be, without assessing if there is a risk of more uh, falling pieces or uh, in unstable structures. And so, so the responsible say, I had to care for the building and for the students, <laughs> not to do mistakes in the in the action. Mm. I know that also. Uh, I, I, I think it should be something like protocols to to deal with. Mm. So you're saying it's about besides interdisciplinarity, it has to do with the planning and the, at the moment of the response and how people get involved in the process of restoration and preservation. Um, I know that Pablo also joined us and he's working with uh, Belen in the same project. Maybe he wants to share some thoughts about what we're discussing now. Well, I don't want to put you on the spot I, because also Maureen is here. And I don't know if, if someone wants to take on the, on the conversation. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I, have a, I have courses, so the, it was uh, the problem for me uh, at the beginning. Well, if the discussion is interesting, I think uh, uh, the uh, dimension of if uh, preserve the culture or uh, how to protect from disaster, well, 
uh, first, if uh, we have to learn that uh, Amazonian culture has uh, lived without uh, ha live, uh, centuries uh, with, uh, with the phenomenal urban phen uh, territorial phenomenon, we, uh, and there was not the problem. The problem begins when uh, uh, we have the urban settlements with uh, urban patterns that came with uh, an occidental culture. So, uh, and there is a, a, another form to make the relationship with the, uh, the territory, no? So uh, I think uh, I, it's uh, in the opposite. Uh, I think we must, uh, the Amazonian culture, it's not only a, a, an objective to preserve, but we must learn about uh, uh, how they make a relationship with that territory, because it's the only way I think to make a, uh, um, to uh, make a better urban patterns uh, in Amazonian. Because now it's a real problem, but uh, we are the real problem, not the Amazonian <laughs> cultures. So mm -hmm. uh, it's for me it's also the no uh, the notion of uh, heritage. It's uh, have a uh, sort of urgence for how we are going to make uh, urban development, for example, uh, in the uh, next uh, in the next decennies, for example. No, Maureen is saying on the chat. It is also a question of what we value and how we decide what is of value and who decide who's of value. What is of value? Helen is saying here. So uh, maybe the panel of our representation should have incur. Um, interdisciplinary research and the challenges of working with local communities and making everyone's opinions of value here. So it's not about just the perspective of the architects or the perspective of the people working from the chemistry, but how do we involve people in the process as well when we are already having all these issues between disciplines when we're thinking of heritage and preservations of sites? Um, I don't know if Sarah want to chip in the conversation here. I think that it's important to involve the people, the locals of the different uh, heritage uh, sites. And uh, uh, in my experience, uh, um, Many, many ideas and many um, approach to the problem came from uh, the interviews that I did to, with the locals. Uh, I, spend, uh, I spent a lot of time talking with the locals, with the Pes Medina inhabitants, and uh, they uh, experience uh, uh, themselves the problems uh, uh, of um, conservation of heritage and uh, um, the this uh, this difficulty these difficulties to approach the heritage and uh, with uh, our contemporary uh, lifestyle and technique and uh, problems so uh, i think that uh, Talking with uh, people, it's uh, crucial. Is uh, it? it, it uh, uh, talking with them, it's uh, it, it's surprising sometimes because uh, they can give you opinions that you didn't uh, expect or know uh, before uh, the the interview. So. Uh, takes into account their experience, uh, uh, I think it should be improved in uh, interdisciplinary project. I know the chat is quite alive. So I've been reading your comments there, but I want to uh, put a question on the table for all of the panelists here. Um, what do you think that could enrich the study of disasters and protection of heritage sites if we develop a more interdisciplinary research? How far are we on the road doing this work? Or how far away are we from um, developing this kind of work? 
uh, I would like to hear because you have experience of working in interdisciplinary from interdisciplinary perspective, from including people like you were saying on the chat, like we work with um, sociologists, we work with architects, we work with people from different fields. So from your experience, what brings to the table that adds to the conversation, but not just the conversation, but the work that people do on heritage sites? Uh, for me, the most important uh, is that the leader of the project should be a conciliant people. If the people gets that everyone get along with the others, that will be a very successful project. Uh, uh, the people with good uh, human skills <laughs> to deal with everybody and they leave everybody satisfied and no starting problems because sometimes the disciplines are hard and mm -hmm. one say that I, I, I don't get how those guys don't, don't understand this but the, the conciliating people should be the leader. It's interesting, like oh, the first lesson here then, how on how to enrich the study of disasters and heritage sites. And it will be to have someone who can deal and make people um, part of the process. And maybe what I'm taking from your words, Margarita, it's um, to make people feel here by everyone. So like, moving on to a more like into communication and skills here, not just about the, the sites. Because the technical part is not so relevant if you are not good in dealing with the mm. respect to the other peoples, to understand, to hear their opinions and conceal them. I saw some of you nodding, <laughs> maybe Pablo, maybe Belen. Yes. Well, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I would emphasize uh, the importance of uh, share an approach. For, for me, it's uh, essential because uh, in, an inter in an interdisciplinary way, uh, uh, we learn each other. It's not uh, the position that one is specialist for something and the other for another thing. We make a team. So in a team, we have to share some uh, approach. And in this uh, way, we, uh, uh, we learn to uh, discover another way to uh, think the, and uh, the, uh, the think about how the how to work. So uh, for me, it's that uh, the most important thing. We are the uh, uh, so the approach we uh, is a construction of a group. It's a collective uh, deal. It's uh, for me that uh, most important thing. For example, in this experience uh, that uh, Belen has led, for example, in the Amazonia. Uh, case. How to find uh, how to find a common approach then? Do you think that people? This will be um, a question for Pablo. Do you think that people um, teams will have to do this before they start doing this work, or it is something that it gets? I don't know. Develop along the process. I think along the process because. Uh, is a deal, uh, an, an objective, a common objective that is the motivation to make up the common approach, you know? Because uh, for example, before this uh, research, you know, I have my works in, uh, in uh, as sociologist, Belen as architect, uh, but with a common uh, objective, we have to make and a, a common approach. And I think I have learned, uh, I, I have learned uh, many things with this exchange. 
you know, so and this uh, this make more fruitful my now I think um, my, my form of, uh, of working would be different because uh, I have there is not only the thing, things like as a specialist, but I think also the integration of uh, of common of common approach that is uh, uh, the the thing I I most uh, appreciate from this exchange. As as Belen is saying here on the chat. Uh from interdisciplinarity to transdisciplinarity, the co-creation of knowledge that goes beyond the sum of different disciplines. And I guess that we can only reach transdisciplinarity by trying to be interdisciplinary first. And then, as you say, like there is something that comes out of the process of working together that then you have something in common. But before that, it's just people from different disciplines like Margarita trying to explain what's the chemistry of the product that they're using and how that could, uh, I don't know, make things worse. And Sara was saying, I think that's another important aspect is the humility of the conservation approach. And I would like to hear more that from about that, if you want. I think that, I think that we have to, uh, when we approach a project, a conservation project, especially uh, uh, on heritage, I think that uh, we have to uh, consider that uh, uh, we are like uh, someone have said before me. We have to learn, and we from the uh, heritage, from the technique, from the uh, people that lives there, uh, and to we have not to. Um, uh, uh, to uh, impose our view, but to comprehend, comprehend the uh, uh, life, the architecture, and the, and respect that. Uh, not to um, use uh, um, incompatible or uh, um, different kind of. Uh, um, materials and uh, systems. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the, in the people, the team, the interdisciplinary team that works in this project uh, has to share this view of uh, respect and uh, humility uh, for the uh, heritage that they are going to uh, to rehabilitate and uh, uh, enhance. So yes, uh, the the human aspect is really important uh, for the success of this project. Mm. So what I'm hearing from you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's that when we think of interdisciplinarity, I will think of uh, different knowledges, right? From different disciplines but it's not just about the disciplines it's about the different knowledges and when we think of that we're thinking of it is not just us people in the university who carries knowledge and develop knowledge so when we think of interdisciplinarity too we maybe should think of what other knowledges are present and how do we make that part of the conversation as Pablo was saying um, at the beginning of his intervention it is maybe as the problem, people already have the knowledge. They've been here, like what we saw in the pictures from Belen, showing how people already have a process, have a technologies to um, accommodate to, I don't know, climate change or even the tides, which it has been part of their culture and the way of living and inhabiting the territory. Um, Maureen says different ways of being in the world. Maybe Maureen wants to add a little bit about that. Yeah, I think um, it, it's also about learning to value what other people value. And sometimes we don't do that when we work within our own discipline or our own professional structure. And um, uh, the question right very early on, which was about well, how can you protect um, uh, uh, the Amazon peoples? Um, and still protect their heritage. I think, first of all, you have to ask the question, 
uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of insider outsider tension, you know? So uh, we're assuming we can answer that question from the outside when maybe we, we don't share the same lived experience of the people who have a, have a degree of adaptation in the world. Um, and first of all, we have to ask the question of them about what they value uh, and bring that into uh, everything we're discussing. We're used to brainstorming, but we often brainstorm with people like ourselves. You know, when, when you brainstorm with people from very different uh, perspectives and, uh, and lives, it, you, you get, if you're lucky, you get some really interesting innovations and things that you would never have thought of because they don't come out of your own personal experience. So um, the, the kind of interdisciplinarity we're talking about is this trying to find these ways of working um, uh, that don't allow one discipline or one profession to dominate um, the solution, you know, choosing the solution because it could be a quite the complex solution in the end. So what I'm hearing here, it's maybe we should think of some kind of critical interdisciplinarity and not just universal uh, <laughs> interdisciplinarity that comes from the university. Um, I don't know, I, I find very interesting where the conversation is leading us because we're moving from, from the importance of the university and the fields are where we work in towards um, other knowledges that are beyond what we learn at the university, right? Um, I don't know if someone has to something to say about this from the presenters because I would really like to hear more about because you are experiencing like Belen when she's working doing field work and working with the people like how do you face this? I think uh, to make it even more complex, it's not only talking or working and recognizing the knowledge from the inhabitants, from the communities I work with, but also the restraints or like understanding how to move around with the political knowledge, you know, like the plans, the laws, the heritage constraints and things like how do you move around that? Uh, or like recognizing the limits uh, in the way those um, laws are written um, and, and, and what is being understood, not only like what is heritage, but also like, I guess I'm, today I'm coming with a lot of questions, not answers, so apologies for that. <laughs> but it's more like reflections. So what is risks? Who decides what is risk? Uh, and then you have like this very bureaucratic, top-down decision-making of gay, like, uh, like, like, you know, the checks to say, okay, this is a risk situation. This is an area that it's inhabitable, even though it has been inhabited for centuries, just in a different manner. And therefore the way to solve that is to move these people around. So like, there's also, it's a very, like, that would say like, that's why we also put like such an emphasis on the process of, of co-production of knowledge itself, because you have not only like multiple disciplines discussing this and like ways to approach it, different kinds of knowledge from the citizens and the people that inhabit a certain area, but also like all these politics uh, within the nation state, within the local government, but also like international laws, like on heritage, on planning and city making and on what on disaster risk reduction. So it's, it's quite uh, like how you find a common ground with all these flows of knowledge and understanding of uh, the world. Mm -hmm. Adding from that, it's what Margarita was saying earlier, right? What are some of the things that we should consider when we do this kind of work? And she said, have someone who knows how to deal with people and to like listen to everyone and incorporate people into a conversation. And now you're adding a different layer here, which is about the politics, like not just that it's a law, but at the same time, it's the politics of like internal politics of uh, local communities and at the same time of the state of the I don't know, the government. So it, it's these different ways of being in the world and taking from different dimensions. I don't, I don't know if anyone has another questions from the audience, um, but otherwise 
I would like to give you some, because we have some time left, if you want to add something that you think that you must put into conversation after this very interesting discussion, I open the floor for the presenters and, and Pablo and Maureen too, uh, if you want to add something to the conversation here. I see your face is doing this, so I think that you want to say something, so go ahead. <laughs> well, if you don't want, I, I thought that Pablo wanted to say something because he was nodding. <laughs> Well, you you la you want well. Uh, I was thinking, not uh, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, I think uh, oh, do, uh, do, uh, this uh, way to work uh, the importance uh, is uh, also in this uh, ways of uh, share and ex make exchange. Uh, I think it's very important uh, uh, be all uh, how we can uh, be uh, questioned uh, inter, uh, by uh, the uh, cultural heritage, uh, for example. No, for me, because uh, if, if uh, for example, in the Amazonian history, is is here, if it is something that it's a, it's a problem. Uh, obviously is uh, make urban settlements uh, in the Amazonian space. That's uh, 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 it's only a century of, of urban history in the Amazonian. And so uh, we cannot make uh, the question of how uh, cultural communities uh, can survive or or how, uh, why is the importance of his heritage, but also is uh, now is the, uh, the moment that this heritage, this way of living in the Amazonian territory can interpel, make question of how uh, finally the urban patterns can uh, make, uh, can be a uh, question uh, for the, 21st century because uh, it's obviously we if we have problems now in the global sustainability of, um, for example for the Amazonian is uh, because we are making a standard a pattern of occupation that uh, makes problems no and I think it's uh, the scenery of the discussion. And, and it's a discussion that uh, needs all the, uh, the disciplines approach to together share and build something new. Mm. So Maureen, maybe you want to add something to run out the, the conversation? Um, <laughs> it's got very complex, hasn't it? <laughs> mm. Life is complex. Um, I don't know what more I can, I can uh, add to this particular thread, really. Uh, for, for me, it's usually around how people make decisions about what should be valued, what should be regarded as heritage, and what should not. And the issue, you know, you began, Carla, this issue of movement. And I think movement, you know, something that's not static, in place, not a fixed building, um, but yet has tremendous value for the way people, people live is uh, this form of cultural heritage. There's, uh, th there's not a lot that, that focuses around that. Uh, and yes, there's some, but um, mostly people are thinking about the fixed and they're not thinking only about the fixed structure, but the fixed people and people who move around um, uh, such as the case study that Belen has, uh, has, has presented, but also travelers or rumor or gypsies or 
pastoralists and uh, nomads, you know, they, 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 they don't leave the same kind of traces on the world. And yet, you know, we can learn, particularly in terms of adaptation to crisis situations and just to uh, very severe environmental conditions. You know, we can learn so much from this M more mobile and giving way of living in the world, I think. Um, we, don't, we don't always um, value that. And it seems like the solution might be to put people in a concrete box house and fix them in somewhere that's safe. And yes, it may be safe and they may not get flooded there, but they've actually lost their, their whole lives, way of living and their livelihood so um, somebody has made a decision that this fixing in place and, and staying away from the flood hazard is the thing of most importance. But what has it done to the people and the people's lives in the process? And I think we have to talk to people and how they live in the world to understand uh, what the solutions might be. And there isn't just this one I'm going to come in as an architect, a planner, an engineer, a chemical engineer, a sociologist, and have all the answers because, because we don't. We have a particular contribution to make, but we can make a much richer one if we listen to and work with others. Uh, as Bellin says, you know, you, you move into this transdisciplinarity kind of world, which is uh, better for everyone, I think. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Sarah? I'm calling your names because I yes. want everyone to have- I was thinking, I was think that uh, Maureen uh, intervention, uh, it's uh, a perfect ending for this, uh, for this uh, talking because uh, I think she has, uh, uh, she said, uh, <laughs> She points out that every the 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 real we we don't have the answer. We we only have to make question and try to 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 involve uh, different disciplines to try to answer that questions. So we and we try to involve uh, the the people. Uh, uh, of, uh, of the sites of the community to 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 answer the question uh, together with the with the interdisciplinary teams. I think it's uh, uh, I I don't feel that I ca that I can add more than Maureen uh, has said because uh, <laughs> I really liked the intervention. <laughs> And I really like the idea of movement because we're thinking yes. about things and to put them as they yes. supposed to be. But what about the like natural flow of things and how we yes. address that? Um, yes. Belen, do you have any final words for us here? Uh, no, really, I think I've spoken enough. Uh, but yes, <laughs> movement <laughs> and migration as a way of being um, and understanding. I think like actually the, if you see throughout history uh, in, in humanity, the exception is stability. Like our settlements are the way that we move it. That's like the, the condition. So I think we need to, in, in law in in planning and, and, and in our understanding, we need to like go back to um, understanding that that is an adaptation strategy. Um, Thank you. Margarita? Well, over here, we used to say that the politics should work on the streets so they can see the real problems before to propose any urban or, uh, settlements or changes in the realities. And because uh, politics made the decision to assign some budget to build any stuff and Usually, you said why they think this will be useful, because it's taking people problems, um, creating density 
the traffic, etc. So one of the roles of the leadership in the interdisciplinary teams should be deal with the people of the, of the project plus deal with the politics so they, they with the project get the budget for being realized. So I think that that will be the final words for the very interesting panel. And um, I want to thank Sara, Belen, Pablo, Margarita, and Maureen for their presentations and for the knowledge they share on the Q&A. And I don't know, I think that we have more questions now. And I think that uh, one, I will take one outcome from this conversation, which is uh, interdisciplinarity without um, working with people who are not part of our um, disciplines, it's just as important as to think of these problems as interdisciplinary. And I would like also to thank everyone on the comments and the chat because it was very alive. If you wanna check, people were sharing um, papers and points of view. And I thought that it, that was also like having a, a second session here. So thank you everyone who participated on this. And also uh, without uh, finishing, I would like to thank Stefan Bogel, the executive director of CIHIDEN, Catherine Campos and Nuria Chiara Palazzi who worked really, really hard to put this panel together, getting in contact with you guys and, and getting everyone on board. And I would like to thank also uh, Umberto who I can see now, but uh, Yep. for the invitation to you. then to do this. And we also have tomorrow, I'm gonna use the floor for this. Tomorrow we have a side event on coast and this in desert um, and heritage. And those events will be in Spanish and we have the information online too, if you want to join us and we will keep talking about this topic. So thank you very much for everyone for attending. And now I, I, I know that Umberto is going to yep. say some final words. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. And uh, thank you, um, everybody, for the contribution and the discussion to this, uh, to this session today. It was very, very interesting. The, uh, I don't want to, to, yeah, to add some word about an interdisciplinary, but I think that uh, the problem of interdisciplinary are the disciplines. Uh, if we if we focus on on problems and not in disciplines, not in university, and in, in you know the the uh, the problem have the solution also and involve uh, all the, the the knowledge that they need to be solved, um, and the problem of course that the people are part of that uh, that system called problem. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, again, thank you, Carla, for the moderation and uh, Stefan for the organization and all the, the group of SIKIDEN that um, uh, with which we organized this, uh, uh, this session today, but also all the seminar uh, of this month. Um, Tomorrow, as Carla said, we will have a side event organized by uh, by Sikiden in uh, and but uh, this Friday we will have another session of this uh, this month theme related with disaster and pandemics. The um, the title of the session of this Friday that start at uh, thirteen uh, one p.m. UTC is intangible heritage and disasters. And it's moderated by Alejandra Alburne. And uh, as Mario said, that Mario, we, uh, it's one, uh, an, uh, one of our, uh, you know, best uh, friend and uh, follower in this seminar. Uh, Mario, we will coordinate a session with Cristina Camero that was here um, a while before. Uh, on uh, 25, um, May 25, uh, an interesting discussion about information technology, pandemics and disasters. And uh, please uh, follow us. And uh, if you want to be in touch with us, you can follow our social network and the YouTube channel in which we will leave all the discussion and the, the seminar uh, and the contribution of all of you. Thank you again and see you soon.
Thanks for the invitation. Abrazo, Margarita. Thank you, everyone. Gracias Thank a todos. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.